any society that is set up solely to profit a wealthy class while the majority of the people toil, and that society should not stand. We are seeing ourselves as spirits and trying to completely detach from any material or societal pressure. Living in the States, you're living in one of the most brutal societies in the history of the world. Zach De La Rocha is a singer and lyricist best known as the frontman for the iconic rock group Rage Against the Machine. As indicated by its name, the band was founded on the idea of challenging authority. This idea is evident across all four of Rage Against the Machine's albums, as well as Zach's personal political activism. In this 1992 interview, he breaks down the band's name on a deeper level. I look at the system that we're living under right now as a machine. I view it as a system which wants to do anything to, to keep itself afloat. It fronts as a democracy, it fronts as a system who claims to represent people and represent freedom. Now these quote unquote moral action, but in reality we'll just do anything simply to keep it afloat. And I see this machine as like an engine that has been fueled and run off the blood of oppressed people like all over the world. So it's, it's a name that I use to describe more so than to describe my frustrations and my anger, being a Chicano, being having indigenous blood, and, and being part of a of a culture which has been completely colonized, and there's been this dominant culture that's been uh, raping our minds for, for years. So, uh, yeah, I want to express my frustrations toward it. And his sense of frustration comes through clearly in his music. Rage Against the Machine declares, "So-called facts are fraud. They want us to allege and pledge and bow down to their god." Zach takes us further into the machine of America in this next interview. Living in the States, you're living in one of the most brutal societies in the history of the world. You know, the country who inherited the uh, genocide of the Native American peoples, uh, a country which participated in chattel slavery, you know, the only country in the world to use and drop an atomic bomb on another country, society. The, the country which, which murdered and enslaved millions in Southeast Asia uh, as a result of the Vietnam War. And we drew from, from the people who resisted. We were inspired because we feel that, that any society or any government or any system that is set up solely to profit a wealthy class while the majority of the people toil and suffer and sell their labor power, so long as that system's only true motive is profit interest and not the maintenance and embitterment of the population uh, to meeting human needs, then that society should not stand. It should be challenged and questioned and overthrown. Waking up to the long legacy of brutality of American history, subjugating the world's population, has been uh, something we wanted to challenge through music. You know? But where did this rebellious attitude come from? Surely his upbringing has a lot to do with it. Going back to Zach's childhood, it's clear that growing up in Orange County had a large impact on many aspects of his identity, including being a key contributor to his love for punk music. I, I grew up in a very, uh, you know, I was, I was a Mexicano in a part of the country where I was the exception to the rule because most Mexicanos in Orange County were there because they had a broom or a hammer in their hand or were pick, picking baskets of strawberries, you know? There was a deep sense of, of frustration, and alienation I experienced growing up in a, in a very conservative community, very racist, very conservative community. And I think that that's what initially uh, attracted me to punk music and punk culture. It, it spoke to me in a way that no other music up to, at, uh, until that point could speak to me. So. It, it kind of happened. It was spontaneous. It wasn't a lot of thought put into it, you know. Yeah, we, we were very uh, excited about the idea of playing hip-hop with live instrumentation, you know, and fusing the music that we loved so much that we felt uh, drawn to. Um, so, I, I don't know, it was very spontaneous. There's no way to say exactly how the sounds came together or, or why. <laughs> Prior to Rage Against the Machine, Zach was a member of the hardcore punk band Inside Out. It was a very spiritual time in Zach's life, and I believe this phase helped shape the rest of his career. Yeah, we were seeing ourselves as spirits, trying to completely detach from 
any material or societal pressure. I mean, we recognize that the only amount of success one could gain would be financially. In, in, in the eyes of the majority of society, that was what made someone quote unquote successful. You weren't recognized as an artist or a thinker or a poet or uh, whatever until you were making money at it. And that's, that's how it is in society, it seems to be, to me. And, and so it was really like an introspective and spiritual part of my life. And it was just like, it's all about not bowing down to a society which really didn't give a fuck about who I was. So, the sense of political revolt in Rage's music comes as no surprise, and is illustrated by their distorted guitars, loud drums, and Zach's aggressive vocals. Amongst that chaos, it may be hard to hear a sense of spirituality. Despite this, Zach confirms a connection between politics and spirituality in every song. Yeah, I feel like all of them are political. Um. I feel all of them are spiritual, for all of them are pretty emotional. Some people don't see the difference between uh, or, or, or differentiate the political songs and spiritual songs. And I feel like so much is connected in the political environment we stand in with, with how we feel spiritually. As, as you know, I consider myself a spiritual person. Uh, initially, I never made that connection when I was with Inside Out. It just wasn't uh, as prevalent within our music. I was dealing with just like personal ideology, personal struggle. And now that I'm seeing how, um, like in America, for instance, the political system has so much an effect on how we are spiritually. I mean, growing up in this capitalist society has been very um, detrimental to us having compassion in our lives and, and, and being just being spiritual, we're thrown into this rat race in life. And so, uh, yeah, I'd say every, every one of our songs is, is political and spiritual as well. I just want to write confrontational music, you know, music that uplifts consciousness as well as confront and, and, and inform and help people to become more aware. It's, it's, it's part of my own evolution as a human being. You know, I'm trying to become more aware. I'm trying to heighten my own awareness. I have to do that first before I can, you know, do that for anyone. So. Uh, it's all about living a simple, conscious life, man, and trying to help people do the same and, and recognize how still very volatile and unjust the system we live under is. Now that we've heard the influence behind the songs, it makes me wonder about their album names and artwork. Rage's second studio album, Evil Empire, was a massive success. There's no doubt people not only connected with its tracks, but also the title and image the album portrays. Empire, I mean, is something that the state has become. The United States is an empire. It is a, one of the most powerful forces within the global economy. The title actually came from a speech given by Ronald Reagan in the 1980s as he addressed the Soviet Union as the evil empire. The aggressive impulses of an evil empire. And if you look at the atrocities committed by the U.S. in the latter half of the 20th century, we figure that name or that tag could easily be used to describe the U.S., and so that's why we used it. The image of the second record was a little more ironic, you know, <laughs> considering, you know, if you, if you look very closely at the boy's face, to us he symbolizes the power structure in the U.S., and if you look at him, he's smiling as if he's in control. But if you look deeper into his face, you see that he's afraid, hmm? because he knows what's coming. He knows that poor people in the U.S., are not going to continue to suffer in the way that they suffer without taking action against them. So we feel that that picture uh, captured that very well. Zach's stance on the empire is clear, but where would he initiate change if given the power? If I were to change anything, I'd, I'd right away I'd jump into attacking the educational system on a local level at first and then take it from the regents of the UC system, they're carrying on an, an ideology which is detrimental to a multicultural society. They need to be addressed and pressure needs to be put on that to address the importance of having a multicultural society. Our culture simply isn't represented in our educational system to the point where I mean, they just don't recognize its importance. That needs to happen. I take it all the way down to the grade school curriculums as well. Do you think? Education is definitely the root. I 
think it's I think it's a very very crucial part. Definitely, if, if I was taught growing up my contributions as a Chicano and who I was, it would have empowered me earlier on. And I would have been able to uh, orient myself and to have a stronger sense of my identity. And not, maybe not take so many like paths that got me into trouble and shit, you know. Um, and really, that hurt my self as a person of self-esteem. I know that how it affects a lot of Chicanos, man. They, we've been colonized and oppressed for over 500 years. It's, it's, it's confused us and it, it's, it's enraged us. And unless we recognize what has happened to us, you see manifestations of violence against our own people because of that misunderstanding. Because we don't understand what's happened, we just find ourselves confused and mad. Have a weak sense of our own identity. And so, um, until we begin to recognize that, you know, we're not going to solve any of our problems. And it's so much a part of why we can't organize as a community either. We need to, we need to tackle that. And I think an anti-bias curriculum would be a perfect way for our children to grow <clears throat> and not become disoriented so early on. I mean, it's said that by the time children are in the fourth grade, they're already disoriented from who they are, being part of a, of a Eurocentric educational system. And that's probably the first thing I would attack and address, <laughs> definitely.